Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. You know, technology can sometimes be amazing because that worked. So <laughs> whenever you try something new, you're never quite sure what's going to happen. So I had some friends create those original pieces. Um, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But I do want to welcome you all here to Arizona History Happy Hour. Thank you all so much for being here. So this is, gosh, I think this is now our 13th episode that we've been doing this. So it is Thursday, July 9th, um, and we are going to be going and going and going. We've got a great show for you this evening, but I do want to say welcome and thank you so much for being here. I mean, this is the reason why I do this is because with all of what's going on and now even today, kind of as the governor says, you know, if you need to go out, stay home and wear a mask. And so with all that going on, this was really created out of a love and wanting to share stories and hear stories and keep learning. Because in this moment, I realized I was being very insular and not really getting a chance to talk to other people hear their stories, reach out. And so this was a goal to really try and change that and really a way to just kind of share the love of Arizona and this amazing place that we're all in as we're all now kind of stuck wherever we are. And so if you would like to help in the show, um, there is my Venmo at the very top of the screen. You can throw me a little bit of something. I am happy to say we are sponsored today by AARP of Arizona. And with them, they say the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. ARP is here in Phoenix and throughout Arizona, providing information that can help you and your family. And you can find out more about some of their services and other programs they offer, virtual as well. And that is at aarp.org backslash AZ for Arizona. And so the music was actually created by my friend Cole Travis, who just graduated from ASU in performance. And my friend Chris Allen did the video. I've used him for a variety of other videos and we've got some fun projects coming up, hopefully for October. Cause you know, I normally would do a series of haunted things, a haunted tours, kind of things like that. And so we're now looking to see what else we can do. And so that should be a lot of fun, but there'll be more coming up on that. So tonight we're going to be going through a variety of, of course, we have our trivia. We have Amazing Little Arizona. We have some music history. And then from my own collection, as well as we have some very special guests from the Arizona Historical Society, my friend Jen and Janie, who are going to be, will be doing the quiz. And it's going to be a lot of fun tonight because we are pulling things, they've pulled things from across Arizona. So get ready to have some fun with that. So my name is Marshall Shore. I am your host. I am also known as the Hip Historian. Now you might wonder, how does one get a name like the Hip Historian? Well, you know, about 20 years ago, maybe a little longer now, I was working in a library in Brooklyn. And unlike today, it was really cold. And I had had enough of snow and I was ready for a change. So we loaded up everything we owned into a big orange cube, a U-Haul, and drove all the way out here, only to bring the truck right back to the International World Headquarters for U-Haul, which is right here in the Valley of the Sun. And we promptly moved into a little 1956 ranch house. Now, when we moved into it, it was beige on beige on beige on beige on beige on... And the, you get it, you get the idea. There was lots of beige involved. And I'm happy to say now it is a very simple two-tone of seafoam and cantaloupe. And this is what my kitchen looks like today. 
all that buttercream yellow tile. In fact, friends call our house the unmuseum because it really is like walking back in time. It truly is a time capsule. We try to keep it to that same time period. So there's all that buttercream yellow tile. You've got that yellow in the wall oven. And if you'll notice your oven that you likely have in your house and that oven don't look quite the same because my oven does not have a window in it. So if I wanna bake something, I've gotta be very careful checking on it. But even more important, when you shut that door, if you let it slam, your cake will fall and nobody wants a flat cake quiche, whatever, you want that air in there to stay there. Now, as soon as I got here from New York, all I kept hearing about was how there was no history. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, I came face to face with so many amazing stories. And then there's that post-war boom, all those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on their way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers and looking for homes just like mine. And then there's this man, Dr. Carrier. Without him, none of us would be smiling today or in the next few days. He brought to the Valley of the Sun and Arizona to the Southwest air conditioning. A way that we could all sit and be cool without just in some of the large buildings, they would pull air from underground and tunnels and do conditioned air, but he brought us air conditioning. As well as the Phoenix New Times has named me best historian several years in a row, as well as Phoenix Magazine named me the best bespectacled Phoenix celebrity because I do like my eyewear. Now, you know, I've, got a, I've developed a whole reputation for having my own idea of what I think looks good and so we always talk about what is Marshall wearing? Because everything with me has a story. And so you might remember every, every, every February 14th, we have a big celebration for ourselves. Statehood. And back in 2012, we had one heck of a statewide celebration and even right in front of the Capitol. They had a main stage, had all kinds of events going on. And someone gave me 15 minutes on the main stage to talk about anything I wanted to. And I chose to talk about one of my most favorite events that most people don't know anything about. It was started back in 1926 by Charlotte Hall, who was our first poet laureate. Now, if you ever make your way to Prescott, you can go visit her house which is now also a museum because it not just housed her, but as well as territorial governors before it became a state. And so she started the first event that was called Mask of the Yellow Moon back in 26. Now it ran from 26 to 1955. It was first held at the Elsreber Shriners Temple, still standing just down the street from the state capitol. It then moved to Montgomery Stadium, which was our first stadium in Arizona. And they would pack those seats. They also held things like our very first bowl game, which was called the Salad Bowl. Now, I sure wish someone would bring that back because I've already got my blue cheese dressing just waiting to have a little bit of salad. Now, what would you expect from the salad bowl? Why none other than the queen showing up on her float, which is a salad bowl. And if you look close, you'll notice even a spoon and fork to serve with. The event was called Mask of the Yellow Moon. It was originally based on a legend about how the God of Sun would give his rays to make the earth golden and warm and make things grow. So it was always a springtime event. Now it was woven through the curriculum of Phoenix Union High School. So everybody got involved. The debate club had skits they would do. You had multiple marching bands and really huge sets. As well as dance. It was actually a rite of passage for so many young ladies and 
for them, it was like the first time they felt a part of something larger than just themselves, being on the field with all these folks. Now, they also were able to wear amazing costumes. And so those costumes were designed by students, made by home mech, and I was lucky enough to find a few of them in a box. And I was allowed to borrow them for 24 hours because they normally don't loan things like this out. But the museum said, well, you know, this would be the one time they would do that for the celebration of 100 years of statehood. And so I was able to convince three friends to put them on. So what you're looking at here are dresses from the late 30s. Now, some of you might know me and realize that I'm not a very good wallflower, that I needed something that would stand up to those amazing dresses. And so I got on the phone with my friend Glenn, who is in his early 90s now, but when he rolled in town in the early 50s, he was a sign designer. And he designed some signs all around town that are still standing. And so I said, Glenn, you know, I need something. And so I said, you know, what about a suit coat? And so he painted a suit coat to look like the Arizona state flag. And oh, and there's one of his signs, my florist, over on 7th Avenue and McDowell. And so he painted this as an homage to the flag. Well, it then got me going on, well, you know, why you just have one suit coat when you can have multiple suit coats on a variety of themes by other artists around town? So that's exactly what I've done. And so sometimes we have a costume change, but nothing quite like that today. But one of the reasons why I always like to start with this story is because you never know where the next piece of a story is coming from. So one day I was presenting to a group called the Arizona First Families. And when I was done, this woman tapped me on the shoulder, said, let's go to my car. So we go out and she pulls out this dress this black dress covered with these butterflies and flowers. This was her mother's dress that she wore in the Mask of Yellow Moon. What was even cooler was she had programs that her mom had given to her from 28 and 29. Now, at that point, the librarian in me kicked in, and because I didn't have white gloves, I didn't want to touch those pieces of paper and degrade them any further. So I look forward to getting a, another shot at those flyers to figure out exactly what year and what number this amazing dress was worn in. But you never know where that next bit of story is coming from. And so, and people have been my best source of stuff because they will bring up things that you might not be able to find so easily in the newspaper or in other periodicals, or they'll link things together or tell you a little personal story that just makes it sound more real and things that might not have been even written about. And because it is Arizona History Happy Hour, of course we have a cocktail. And so today, I'm so excited because we get to travel to the Arizona Biltmore. So the Arizona Biltmore, which is an amazing resort, and when it opened up in the late 20s, it opened up actually during Prohibition. But once Prohibition ended, lots of celebrities were hanging out there and well-to-do folks. And so they had a bartender named Jean. And at one point, a longtime patron comes up and says, you know, I love tequila. It's hot out. I need something refreshing. And so Jean threw together a cocktail that was called the Tequila Sunrise. And so it's not the 70s Tequila Sunrise you know with the grenadine and the orange juice that actually looks like a sunset. But this is the original tequila sunrise. So that's what we're gonna make and let's see how our technology is today. Let's see. All right, so we have our little bar over here. So we're gonna have some, we have our tequila. And with this, you can use pretty much, I would say, any tequila you would like. You can go fancy. You can go less than fancy. But because there's lots of other stuff, or there's a few th other things in it, you don't have to go super fancy for this. 
All right, and then we're gonna throw in a little bit of lime juice as well. And then we have cream de cassis, which is a black currant liqueur. So we're gonna pour that in. And look at that lovely color on there. And then we're gonna dump a little bit of ice in there. Good thing I wash my hands, as you should all be doing. All right. And then, because I love myself Hello Kitty, I have my Hello Kitty chopsticks to stir my lovely tequila sunrise with. And there we go. And cheers. Oh, that's pretty darn tasty. I like it when that happens. All right, so hopefully you're all having a, a lovely libation as well. Maybe something iced, maybe tea, maybe something else. So now we're gonna talk about something from my own collection. So I have a whole fascination with, and then let's see. So here we're gonna go back to, so I love film. I'm always looking for film. And so this is some really special film. It is Phoenix, it actually was given to me by my friend Gail. And Gail's father actually moved here from Glendale, California. He was working at a restaurant that some of you may have heard of called Bob's Big Boy. And so when Bob noticed that there were these other restaurants doing franchises. He decided that he would send his own staff over here to do exactly that, start looking at what they could do for a franchise. So we had actually the first franchise right here in Phoenix. He had four of his staff and so Gail's dad was actually an amateur filmmaker, so he took film footage of the restaurant being built. Now, it was one of the big places on Central. In fact, there were articles talking about when Bob's Big Boy was built, people were shocked that somebody was spending so much money opening up a restaurant in little old tiny Phoenix, and it became an institution. It was on the, let's say, the northeast corner of Central and Thomas, where there's a co-talker statue now. And so, and actually, if you look at the slide, so we have not only the image of Bob's big boy here in Phoenix, the first one, but also if you've ever been to the Arizona Heritage Center, they have a Bob's big boy on display. So, so Jen, that's why I threw this one in because I was like, ooh, it's a way to actually tie in the museum to that. So, so again, I want to thank you all for being here. Um, you also notice that there is our chat off to the side. Now, if you'd also be so kind, if you're watching this on Facebook, if you can click the share button, so that way your friends will see all the fun we're having and get a chance to learn about Arizona. So I see we have lots of friends now watching us. So, Again, thank you all so much for being here. Now, through the miracle of modern technology, we have special guests. And so I will, let's see. All righty. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Very good. So it's so nice to see you too. Always nice, nice to see you too. Here. Happy to be here. Yeah. I know, thank you so much for coming on and getting a chance to share some Arizona history with us. Absolutely. So now I know you both work for the Arizona Historical Society. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I know you're actually in, even in different locations. So yes. you're, you're not both in Phoenix nor in Tucson. Nope. <laughs> so so uh, I will go first. Uh, my name is 
Katie Adams. I'm the Curator of Education for the Arizona Historical Society and the, muse the museum educator for the Arizona History Museum in Tucson. Um, so our mission is connecting people through the power of history and the Arizona Historical Society is the state's oldest historical institution and we are so honored every day that the people of Arizona trust us with their precious, precious objects. Absolutely. Um, so I am Jen Mary and I am an archivist at our library and archives in Tempe at the Arizona Heritage Center. Um, so we actually have seven different locations. Um, the Arizona Historical Society does. Um, you can see them listed on the screen there. And so yeah, Jamie's in Tucson and I'm in Tempe and we have two other museums in Tucson. Um, we have two in Flagstaff. If you've ever been to the Reardon, um, we are curators of the holders of the Reardon Mansion um, and the Pioneer Museum is ours. And then um, we also have the Sanguinetti House Museum and Gardens in Yuma. And uh, we are gonna try to talk about Arizona history in all of these different locations today. Yay! <laughs> All right, so as many of you know, if you've joined us before, you get a chance to do some trivia. So we have a bunch of questions now. They're not fill in the blank, so even if you don't know the answer, you still have a shot of guessing what the correct answer could be. And so the fun of our trivia is, it's not about showing how much you know, but also at the end of it, we'll go through all the answers and explain them so that way you'll walk away knowing more than you came tonight with. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So question number one. Now you can also type your answers here in the chat. You can also just keep track yourself if you'd like to on with a piece of paper and a pencil. And remember at the end of all of this, we're gonna go through each of the questions again. And we have some fun ones tonight. All right, so our first question, what was the name of the Arizona Rough Riders, the first volunteer cavalry regiment, their mascot, who was a mountain lion, beloved by Teddy Roosevelt? What was the name of that mountain lion? Was it A, Jolene, B, Josephine, C, Judy, or D, Jane? So that mountain lion was named one of those. Which one do you think it was? All right, as we move on. Question two. Which surprising famous person supposedly sent a telegraph to Tucson officials to celebrate the completion of the Southern Pacific Railroad? Was it A, Annie Oakley? B, the Pope, C, Queen Victoria, or D, General Grant? Which one of those famous folks sent a telegraph to Tucson when they completed the Southern Pacific Railroad? All right, question three is a true or false question. In the 1880s, Tucson had a water park. I bet they couldn't go to the water park today. <laughs> so that's a true or false question. So go ahead and take a, a guess. All right, question four. Rivers in Arizona, the Gila, Salt River, the Santa Cruz, San Pedro, Lower Colorado, and the Rio Soyanada are home to a small endangered fish. Name that fish. There's also, there is a little bit of a hint. A captive population lives at the Arizona History Museum, if you've ever been there. So that endangered fish, it is it A, the Arizona guppy, B, the dirty tetra, <laughs> C, the desert pupfish, or D, the Sonoran anchovy. Which one of those is in the endangered fish that you can find 
at the Arizona History Museum. All right, we're at that halfway point. What is the name of the floating metal sculpture in downtown Phoenix? A, Power of Her Majesty. B, Her Secret is Patience. C, Her Power is Empathy. D, The Secret is Power. What is the name of that floating sculpture in downtown Phoenix? All right, so moving on. Who was Arizona's first woman governor? Was it A, Jan Brewer? B, Jane G. Hall? C, Janet Napolitano? Or D, Rose Mofford? Who was the first female governor of Arizona? Gosh, that Tequila Sunrise refreshing. <laughs> All right, seven, we're sliding into the home stretch now. Which Flagstaff resident was the first African-American stewardess on a major airline? Was it Ethel Jean Peters? B, Louise Riles? C, Joan Dorsey? Or D, Catherine, Catherine Hickman? Which one of those ladies was the very first African-American stewards on a major airline? What government agency used Flagstaff as their training ground during the 60s and 70s? Was it A, the National Park Service, B, NASA, C, the Department of Agriculture, or D, the FBI? Which one of those agencies used an area up near Flagstaff as a training ground in the 60s and 70s? All right, we're coming into the home stretch. Only a few more left. During the, the 1857 survey expedition through northern Arizona, what animal was used for transportation? Oh, and I love this question. Oh, my gosh. A, zebras. B, alpacas. C, elephants. Or D, camels. Which one of those animals did they use back in 1857 to wander through northern Arizona? All right, question 10. What is the all-time highest temperature ever recorded in Yuma, Arizona? Was it 117A or was it B, 132? Or was it C, 108 or D, 124. Oh my gosh. All I know is those are all hot. And I think we hit, we at least hit one of those today, I think. Mm -hmm. So luckily it wasn't two of them. But you know, there's still time for that. All right, question 11. What is the name of the four tiered structure that's built on a hill near Papago Park? A, Swilling Castle, B, Tovray Castle, C, Stanton Castle, or D, Williams Castle. And you'll notice the Wedding Cake Castle is not one of the answers. <laughs> All right, so question 12 and almost our final, this is our second to last. True or false, the first capital of Arizona territory was Phoenix. Is that true or false? Or was that territory capital somewhere else that was not Phoenix? <laughs> All right. During the Wallace and Ladmo show, which some of you may have seen, some of you may have even heard about, what was the name of the prize in studio audience members could win? Was it A, a goodie bag, B, toy cottage prize, C, Ladmo prize, or D, Ladmo bags? 
what could people, what could children typically when in studio during the Waltz and Ledmo show? <laughs> All right. There's some very emphatic answers for Wallace and Ladmo. Uh, <laughs> yeah. no, no. You can hear people like yelling. <laughs> I had to turn down my volume because they were yelling so loud. <laughs> so, uh, Marshall, right. I love your announcer voice. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one, of, one of my first degrees in college was actually to go into broadcasting. So, <laughs> I, that's, I immediately, and so I drop into that phone voice. <laughs> that's microphone in front of me, and all of a sudden, there it is. <laughs> all right so arizona music i decided to actually talk about something that also has a little connection to the heritage center as well and so these folks these three guys known as the kingston trio so the kingston trio now they won, actually they won the very first Grammy for folk music that was actually created for them for their album at large. They also won a Grammy for the record Tom Dooley. They won a Hall of Fame award in the late 90s for Tom Dooley. And in 2011, got a Lifetime Achievement Grammy as well as the Kingston Trio was admitted into the Arizona Music Hall of Fame. Now, back in the early 60s, oh, don't worry, Nick. We'll talk about Hook Up in the Wheels another time. There's, I mean, we got lots of time. So. so there was a pilot done for a TV show called Young Men in a Hurry, starring the Kingston Trio. And so I remember finding out about this and being all excited and tracking down Bob Shane, who actually passed away earlier this year. And he was living in Ahwatukee at the time. And so at the Heritage Center, we actually did a showing of Young Men in a Hurry, inviting him to come and then talk about the series and why it didn't go anywhere. Now, he was like, well, what are you looking for? I'm like, I just want you to talk because I can't afford you to sing. <laughs> and so there was no singing involved. So he talked about how the fact that all these three young men, they were all from Hawaii. And the thought of having to come to Phoenix to do continue doing this show, they just couldn't fathom. So they put the kibosh on this show. But I love the, they actually are in Bob's convertible driving down Central. And that's that top image. And the whole show took place throughout the valley. And some of those spots still stand. Some of them don't. But it's a hoot of a show. Hopefully we can do something like that again, just because it's so much fun to just take a look at the valley and what Arizona used to look like back in the day. All right. So answers dead ahead. So what was the name of the Rough Rider mascot? It was Josephine. Josephine. And Marshall, <laughs> in the photo that you see on the screen, not um, Josephine's head, but the other photo, um, it's probably a little small on everyone's screen, but Josephine is in that photo, but there's also another mascot in that photo. And Marshall, do you know the name of their dog mascot? I do not. Okay. That is Cuba. Um, and Cuba was their... Uh, their dog, and they also had a golden eagle, um, which was presented to the New Mexico Rough Riders. But um, Cuba is actually buried in Flagstaff. Oh, wow. So he is on the Sam Black Ranch. And you know, one of the other really kind of great stories about Josephine is, as Jennifer, Jennifer I'm sure that you can also attest to this, um, one of the first questions that people ask you is, if there was a fire, what would you take? And <laughs> your brains thinking about, well, what would I take if there was a fire? What one object would I preserve? And unfortunately, last summer in Flagstaff, we had to answer that question. Um, Josephine, or Josephine's head, literally rode shotgun in the state car as we were throwing in all of the stuff that we absolutely needed to save from the museum fire. Um, thankfully, the museum wasn't damaged, but uh, Josephine 
is among those objects that we would save in a fire. <laughs> <laughs> I love so, that story. So, so we have a question, where is her head today? It's in Flagstaff. It's at the, um, it's at the Pioneer, correct? Cool. Yes. Yeah, it's at the Pioneer Museum. Um, and it was actually it's interesting story because it was donated um, by Alex, Colonel Alex Brody's granddaughter in the 60s. Um, now, I'm not sure if the whole body made it in the 60s and, and if the rest has been lost or if it was just the head. But um, so Colonel Alex Brody saved her head. <laughs> And his it was passed down through his family until his granddaughter donated it. <laughs> All right, question two. Which famous person celebrated the railroad through Tucson? Oh, I was not expecting that to yeah, be the so It was the Pope. Um, and the text is a little small, so I'm gonna go ahead and read it to everyone. So this was a telegraph. Um, that was given to some Tucson officials in 1880. And so the telegraph reads, Holiness the Pope acknowledges with appreciation receiving your telegram, informing him that the ancient city of Tucson at last has been connected by rail with the outside world and sends his benediction. But for his own satisfaction would ask, where the hell is Tucson? <laughs> so, that story, um, there was a big debate for a really long time whether or not that actually happened. Um, and we think, hello, dogs. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Extra guests. Uh, we think that the telegraph did happen, but it was never sent by the Pope. It was probably sent by someone who was making a prank to the mayor at the time and just wanted to make a nasty comment. <laughs> nice. I have an extra guest also, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. That is a great story. Here, I thought you were gonna pull up the, the, the telegram, but I guess not. <laughs> no, so the image you're seeing is the uh, rose window of the original San Augustine Cathedral. Um, unfortunately, well, I guess rather fortunately, the community grew so big that they had outstripped the size of the cathedral and the building was slated for destruction. So someone saved it and paid $75 to have it moved to the Arizona History Museum. Uh, so it greets every guest that comes into the museum now. Very cool. All right. Did Tucson have a water park? Indeed they did. Oh my gosh. Yes. So it's kind of, Water Park was maybe a little intentionally misleading. Uh, we have to remember that this is the Victorian era. So there's lots of decorum and uh, modesty uh, in dress, but they had what essentially amounted to a, a water park. So Leopoldo Carrillo, who is one of Tucson's um, kind of founding fathers. Uh, he was a leading businessman and he created the Carrillo Gardens. And so it was a place where people could kick back by the stream. There was a boat launch. Um, and so you see in this image, these kind of women that are, you know, very dressed up uh, standing next to this body of water. And I can only imagine that this is sometime in mid spring. I don't imagine this is at the height of summer, but maybe it was. I would say hopefully not with the bustle and to the floor length skirts with all the underpinnings and everything else I can't imagine would be delightful at summer. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're dark colors and yeah, that wouldn't be pleasant. <laughs> even, even with a parasol would not be pleasant at all. All right. What was the name of the fish? Oh my gosh. It wasn't the Sonoran <laughs> anchovy. It wasn't the anchovy, no. <laughs> you don't put them on your pizza. Yeah. So these are the desert pupfish, and they really only get to be about mm, so big, maybe a couple inches. Um, they're really hardy little fish. They can live in water that's got really high salinity, really low oxygen. They can survive really high temperatures. They also only need a foot of water. Um, so they're really adapted to the desert environment. 
Unfortunately, their habitat was destroyed by urbanization and the changing uh, water availability throughout the river system in central and southern Arizona. Um, so we are really privileged at the Arizona History Museum to have a captive colony of these fish. We have approximately 300 of them and they are as happy as can be. Nice. And you cannot put them on a pizza. <laughs> well, I mean, you could, but I think game and fish would have something to say about it. Exactly. They would probably come and <laughs> take you away. <laughs> All right, and so that bl big floating sculpture in downtown Phoenix oh, is... Our slide got moved a little bit. I know, I'm like, oh my. <laughs> it is, Her Secret is Patience um, is the title. And this was put up in 2009. Um, and there's a little bit of controversy around it uh, because of the amount of money spent on it for an art piece, um, and it was sort of part of the, considered part of the gentrification of downtown Phoenix. Um, so there was a little a little controversy with that, but the sculpture was actually the, the um, artist, Janet Aikelman, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce her last name, but her idea was the monsoon clouds, um, which we're hopefully going to see soon, I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> And the, the way that the shadows would reflect on the mountains and on the ground. And so she, her colors and her theme is to sort of show that. And it comes from a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, um, which is uh, the actual quote is, let me read it because I'll get it wrong if I try to remember it. Um, the... Let's see. Adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. And it's actually from a collection of speeches that he gave um, that were put together later in years um, as one essay anthology. So um, and his nature poetry is and his speeches are just kind of really beautiful. So I can see how the artist would have gotten inspired by that and our clouds, because we do have some great clouds and our sunsets, you know, our sunsets are the best in Arizona. Well, and I remember, I remember one of the things that also was about this was that it really kind of pushed the whole idea of this kind of metal that's mm -hmm. like almost like, I don't want to say crocheted, but it's, I mean, it's, it's fabricated into this really loose weave and mm -hmm. has actually been used in other places since then, but this was the first time it was done. Yeah. And the artists, um, the, metal workers and she got a bunch of different people together engineers um, from all over the place um, i think the engineer was from paris um so just oh, okay. inspiration from a lot of different places um which kind of makes it a neat addition to downtown right and i love that also you now have people after the controversy you now have people who are talking about it as a locator it's like yeah. they see that and then they realize where they're at downtown instead of always referring back to that controversy of, oh my gosh, did they spend the money correctly or not? Right. And now it's just a piece of the fabric that creates downtown. Exactly. And it's really well lit at night, which is really mm -hmm. cool. So. Yeah, I think the colors are supposed to reflect the seasons, but um, I'm not really sure what seasons we have here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm like, oh. Pretend. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. And the first governor of Arizona was D. Rose Moffer. Rose. <laughs> Rose, um, Rose. So Rose um, was actually the secretary of state by appointment um, after Raul Castro um, took his appointment to or decided to resign to become the ambassador of Argentina, I had to think about that. And uh, so she was an appointed secretary of state, but she was elected um, governor later. And she was a big proponent of a lot of different things. Um, and one of the things I thought was really interesting um, is I remember, I remember when she was governor, vaguely, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, everybody talks about her hair. <laughs> That's, you know, as a kid, that's what I remembered. Um, but she was really influential and she did a lot of really, you know, great things for our state, aside from being the first woman governor. So, right. I mean, she really got people working across the aisle and really yeah. talking 
speaking to each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was her big thing, but her hair was famous. Yes. <laughs> And so her hair salon that she would go to is actually um, Salon de Venus, which is now the parlor pizza parlor. Oh, wow, so okay. If you go there um, in the very back, they still keep some of those beauty chairs. <laughs> oh, wow. There it was. And then um, last year, so I do a series of t-shirts. And so I don't know if you can see, but we did a oh. Oh, goodness. What would Rose do? <laughs> <laughs> Marsha, we'll have to get one from you for the collection. Yes. Oh, that would be great. So, yeah, <laughs> we, we could definitely make that happen. <laughs> That's perfect. I love it. <laughs> All right. Oh, and that slide got moved as well. Yikes. Yeah, it got a little moved. All right. <laughs> So, which flags that resident became the first African American stewardess on a major airline? It was Joan Dorsey. Um, Joan was uh, the first the first African American stewardess for American Airlines, and she was also the first African American person to be promoted to a supervisory position. Um, Joan is also the, or rather, her niece. Coral Evans is the current mayor of Flagstaff. Oh, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. What a great connection that is. Yeah. Very cool. All right. And then this one I love. Oh, also, I didn't realize one of the dorms at NAU is named after her. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So what government agency used Flagstaff as their training ground? It was NASA. Indeed. Indeed. So someone sent me some pretty detailed notes about the, the NASA stuff. Um, but basically, during the time, it's really kind of fascinating that the time period, the 1960s and 70s, because we're really dealing with in Arizona, simultaneous futurism and uh, a, a revision to the primitive, if you will. That's kind of the language that they use at the time. So a lot of these government agencies, particularly NASA, were eyeing the Arizona landscape as a, as a direct analog to the kinds of alien landscapes that astronauts might face up in space. So kind of a, a, an old meets new kind of technology and wilderness approach to space. Well, sometimes it does feel like we might be on Mars or the face of the sun. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then I know some of the folks that have that whole conspiracy theory about did we actually make it to the moon? I'm like, well, you know, they just shot it all here. Yeah. <laughs> So could be, could be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what animal wound up in northern Arizona in the late 1850s? Camels. Um, oh my gosh. Camels uh, built the Beale Wagon Road. Uh, but actually before that um, was when the Secretary of War decided camels would be really great for the military instead of horses forgetting that they're very stubborn <laughs> they uh probably don't listen very well and they didn't really make such a great uh a, a great beast of burden which just as a side note these photos are from our beasts of burden um exhibit at the tempe history center so when we open up again, hopefully people will come by and, and see some more about panels. Um, but yes, and someone mentioned High Jolly, and High Jolly uh, or Haji Ali was uh, the camel trainer and um, handler that they chose for these camels for the military. Um, and he pretty much spent the rest of his life uh, with the camels until the when the Civil War broke out, they sort of stopped using the camels. Um, but they kind of left the camels in the desert. <laughs> so we ended up with a population of wild camels after a while. 
which people don't think about that in the Arizona desert, but I guess because they, they were in the, you know, in the African deserts and, and all of that, they thought camels would be great here too, but. <laughs> a desert's a desert, right? Yeah, exactly. No. You know? no one really kind of knew what to do with them. So, and they were supposed to be mail carriers too, but that didn't work out either. <laughs> And then what is the small picture? There's like a, is that so, a vessel, a bell? A... That is a camel bell. And then the teeny tiny picture that you can't see at all is a picture of Haji Ali's uh, pyramid tombstone in Quartzsite. Indeed, which I love the fact they've, re they've recently redone the whole cemetery, the access road to it. Oh, nice. It's now a paved road. It used to be a little dirt road oh, with a wow. line that was easy to miss. And so now it's, they're redoing the entire town and adding the whole camel. Oh, wow. Okay. Everything in Quartzsite. Well, there was an interesting story when I was uh, reading up on this that in, I'm not sure when, but uh, at some point there were people who believed that Haji Ali belonged to Texas. And so there was a whole conspiracy of people trying to dig up his bones and take him back to Texas. When huh. he wasn't from Texas, he was actually in, from um, somewhere in the Mediterranean, I think. Uh, and Morocco maybe, and uh, which may not be Mediterranean, but anyway, but there was a group of people that believe because he came through Texas with the camels that he was from Texas. So uh, they did not enter him in this land of waste out here in Arizona, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's I mean, I love that now Quartzsite is really kind of taking the fact that right. their most famous resident and now really playing up on him. So mm -hmm. which I think is really cool. And telling the story. His tombstone is his tombstone's great. So <laughs> yeah, no, I, mean, I love that pyramid with a little camel on top. Yep. Yeah. All right. So, what was the highest temperature ever recorded in Yuma? It's 124 degrees in 1995. Uh, when we read that stat, we were all kind of surprised that it was so long ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh, Yuma's, it can be real hot there. Um, so a lot of inventive ways to try to beat the heat in Yuma. Um, there is a, a legend that the first private swimming pool was owned by E.F. Sanguinetti. Um, actually, it was a converted fountain. Um, so I think probably the kids were playing in one day and just couldn't keep them out of it. So they're like, it's a pool now. You kids are right. Um, the unrelenting heat in Yuma also inspired the invention of the home evaporative cooler uh, in the 1930s. And uh, so when the evaporative cooling took off and then was eventually, eventually replaced with air conditioning, um, a lot of people from Yuma could stay during the summer. And then Yuma, of course, is a really uh, popular wintering spot for a lot of our, our snowbird population. Well, I didn't realize that was the home of the evaporative cooler. Yeah, there's a really great article about it in the Journal of Arizona History. I'm not 100% sure what issue it is, um, but if anyone's interested in the article, you can send me an email and I will dig up the article for you. Very cool. And what is the name of that four-tiered structure over near Papago Park? <laughs> it is the Tovrea Castle. Um, not the wedding cake. <laughs> it does look like one. Um, and I, every year I try to get one of the tours and I'm always too late by the time the tickets go on sale. So I really want to check out the inside. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting story. Um, we have actually, when they were putting it on, we have a report in our collection that uh, when they were putting it on, getting it ready to put on the historic register. Um, and it, the castle was built in the Italian style um, because the, the Mr. Torreya was from Italy and it's just beautiful. Just the architecture is gorgeous, but I'm dying to see what it looks like inside. <laughs> so I'm guessing, have you, have either of you been there? No. Okay. So I was lucky enough to actually get a tour of it. I figured. <laughs> and, uh, so before it opened to the public, 
um, Carrara, who actually built the building originally, his granddaughter took me on a tour. Oh, wow. And so it was originally designed to be a hotel. Okay. Oh. And it was going to be a high-end subdivision. And so you would mm -hmm. stay at the hotel and then you would pick out the plot of land where your house would be built, which was all well and good until the wind shifted direction. And then the stockyards next door <laughs> the, became rather odorific. Oh. So. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it was interesting kind of um, talking to her about the house and then also kind of the different stories and the different take on them that then the Tovres had. Mm. So, but yeah, so no, I would love, I would love to get them on at some point as a guest, because again, that's one of those buildings that everyone sees, but the moment those tickets go on sale, they are sold out yes. <laughs> for a yeah. month in advance. Yes. So, yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've, in the past, I've tried working with them to do some special tours that never happened. Um, they've done they've done some things with the stockyards. We actually had like a wine tour where oh, you got to go for a glass of wine and things at um, the stockyards and then walk across the street to the castle. That's awesome. So, yeah. But, I mean, I'm so thrilled that the city of Phoenix was able to purchase this and now bring it back, bring it back to life. And then I think at one point, I think, I think it was SRP that actually owned it. Oh, okay. So there, there was a, a night watchman there. And so I had friends that would sometimes wind up spending the night there because they'd consumed a little too much nearby and <laughs> sleep it off in an amazing place. We should all be so lucky. All right. So true or false, the first capital of Arizona, of the Arizona Territory was right here in Phoenix. <laughs> that is false. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> no, we uh, Arizona couldn't decide where it wanted its capital. So we've had it in several different places. Um, but the first capital was actually Fort Whipple. Um, and so it was the territory territorial capital for a little bit. Um, and then Prescott became the capital next. Um, it's been in Tucson. Uh, it's been in Phoenix. Um, I think it switched back to Prescott at one time. Tucson in Phoenix for a while. Tucson in Phoenix, that's what it was, yeah. And so um, <laughs> Fort Whipple was first and then Fort Whipple became a hospital. And uh, now the Charlotte Hall Museum, I believe, is the owner of the grounds. Um, and, uh, okay. And they did a bunch of reconstruction. Um, and you can go, I believe you can go in the barracks um, and the hospital. Oh, very cool. Yeah, there's a, um, we actually have a collection in our Tucson library of photos during the reconstruction and uh, of, of all the buildings. And they're really, really really neat there's a lot of them <laughs> wow but i love the fact they very so recreating kind of that history mm -hmm. and uh well and charlotte hall also has the uh governor's mansion from when prescott was the capital right all right and so i know there was lots of activity on this question very voracious in terms of people folks knowing the answer <laughs> so, Indeed, what did people get during the Walson Ladmo show? They had a chance to win a Ladmo bag. Yeah, and I noticed several people in the chat have them and and cherish them. And uh, so a funny story about, I don't know if it was specifically this Ladmo bag. We have several in our collection in Tempe, but there, um, there was a Ladmo bag that still had some of the candy in it after many, many years. Um, then how did that candy taste? <laughs> uh, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You should probably ask the, the little friend that probably got to it prior to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that had to go. So, um, but we do have some very, very nice Ladmo bags. Um, and this happens to be, I, I can't see the, the, um, 
plaque on the bottom, but I think this was from the 30th anniversary. It was either the 30th or the 50th. I can't remember um, where this bag is from in our collection, but it's very nicely preserved. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to know what kind of candy they had <laughs> in there because it was uh, not edible by the time uh, we got it. <laughs> Well, and so, and I heard the reason why they went with a Ladmo bag was originally, it was like a wall of toys from the toy cottage. And so kids could go pick their favorite toy, but it was taking them too long to decide on a single toy. <laughs> and so that's when they decided that, well, they should do this small bag and just give things away. And so that way you didn't have to choose. You just yeah. got a bag full of stuff. That makes sense. <laughs> and so people, I mean, are still upset they didn't get a Ladmo bag or <laughs> they had a cousin who got a Ladmo bag or a sister. Yep. There's certain people in this uh, feed I noticed were a little uh, <laughs> she didn't get a bag. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> All right. So. So, gosh. Yeah, so are you guys doing any. So in either location, are you guys doing anything virtual? Since right now museums and so much is closed, we we actually are. Um, we have several programs that we're switching to um, do virtually. Um, on July 29th, we will be doing a virtual um, discussion on how to do an oral history, um, and that will be via Zoom. And you can find that on our website. Um, Janie's got some good programs coming up. Yeah, so we're looking towards doing something in August to commemorate uh, the 19th Amendment. Um, always looking to do something spooky in October. And then we're also trying to figure out um, the best way that we can offer some virtual tour experiences, um, not only for school children, but also kind of the, the interested public. So stay tuned. There's lots of things coming down the pike um, and we're really excited to share all these things with you. And we can't wait to see you in the museum when we reopen. Absolutely. And um, our Twitter, we often have author takeovers on our Twitter. Um, so there's some of that if you're a Twitter follower. Um, check out the Arizona Historical Society Twitter. Um, there's been some really good chats there. And we've got our Instagram. So we've got posts on Instagram that you can follow. Oh, nice. I, I love the way some of the Arizona museums are really taking to Instagram and mm -hmm. posting just an, like an object a day type thing and then kind of telling the story of it. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're trying out different things and we hope the public's liking what we're doing and we like to hear feedback so so and i and i so typically i one of the things i love about the trivia is so many people are like oh you know i only got so many i see lots of people got like 10 out of 13 mm -hmm. as opposed to much lower and yeah. so I, I think it's great that people are starting to just learn because people are saying hey you know i only did this good because i <laughs> some of these answers came out in other stories and earlier. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, that's the fun. So thank you ladies so much for joining us and sharing some Arizona history from the Arizona Squirrel Society. Thank you. So have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. We'll do. Bye everyone. Thank you Bye, so much everyone. for joining thank us. You. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you all. All right. So, you know, that was so much fun. I am so glad they came on because you never, I mean, that's part of the fun is you never quite know what's coming up. Now, one of the things I did was I did ask them what little town did they think should be talked about? Because there's so many options. And so, I mean, I've got kind of my master list. And so I love the fact that they said, you know, let's talk about Tubac. So I don't know if any of you have ever been to Tubac before, but it's such a fun place. I mean, they call themselves the place where art and history meet. It's really a truly historic designation, and they currently have over 100 different eclectic shops that soon, in quotation marks, they'll be open again. 
and you can basically spend the entire day wandering through fashion, leather crafts, antique shops, jewelry shops, a variety of art galleries, all getting a chance to kind of explore Tubac because it is a great little town that indeed does have its own history. Now, one of the things I love is that, A, it's very colorful. Instead of just being lots of beige, there's lots of po color popping around that town. They also have a really great Center for the Arts there that does a variety of different programs and things like that. You know, I don't know if they're doing anything virtual, but I would not be shocked that they would not be having something online. Now, one of the things I love is Harwood Steiger, who was a silk screener. So he would print his fabrics in Tubac. And so he did a lot of really kind of 50s, 60s style graphics. I mean, this is one of my favorites is this cactus motif, the Swaro. Um, so hopefully at some point, I've got a friend who actually is a huge collector. Um, so Tubac is um, down near, just not far from Tucson. So a little bit further south. So it's a great little town, but not only is it all the arts, but then it also has the Presidio, which is a state historic site. And it's the Presidio of Sig San Ignacio de Tubac or Fort Tubac. It was originally built as a Spanish fortress established by the Spanish army back in 1752. The ruins are indeed preserved right here. So you get a chance to see them. Then it was also back in the mid 1840s during the Mexican American war was home to Mexican troops and then was abandoned as well. And then a little later in the 1850s, after the Gadsden Purchase, Tubac became home to dozens of people who were working for Charles Poston at a mine that he had down there. So I love the fact that they have taken this historic site and built upon it and now are sharing so much colorful art down there. Uh, Deb, I'm not shocked that Tubac would be on a cemetery crawl that you'd put together. So, I mean, it's really an amazing little town. So I look forward to a chance when we can all hop in our cars and go for an adventure. Tubac is definitely a place to go because you can get so much entertainment and education on arts as well as just Arizona history and just driving around it as well. So, and remember, if you ever have any questions, you can always throw them in the chat or you can also email me. Now, several of you have sent me ideas for stories or suggestions about future episodes. So please let me know. Or if you just have comments, you know, some folks have sent me about how this is really a highlight of their week as they're kind of self-quarantining and looking for something that is interesting to do. So coming up on the third Saturday of this month, I am part of Virtual Arizona Pride, and we will be talking about the trans history or the transgender history of Arizona. So that should be a really fun program as well. So you can find that by tracking down either Virtual Arizona Pride or Marshall Shore, Hip Historian on Facebook. I'm also part of the Arizona Division Sign Coalition. And we're actually, I'm actually trying to get a couple folks to come on and just kind of talk about how Arizona is kind of the rebirth of neon in Arizona, across the country. A lot of places it's dying, but here there is this huge kind of resurgence of it into the arts community. And so remember, you can always reach out to me at hello at Hip Historian. You can follow me on Facebook at Marshall Shore Hip Historian. Also, if you like this program and will see it continue, please at the very top is a link for Venmo where you could send a little something to kind of help this program run on. And next week we have 
the Tinker History Museum. So that's going to be a fun one as well with Josh. So I've already seen his question. I've already been working on some of those. And again, it's going to be another great trivia night, just sharing some amazing Arizona history. And again, I want to say thank you all so much for being here. I also would like to say thank you to AARP of Arizona for... Actually, I just got on Zelle, and I don't remember what my password is for Zelle, Gloria. Um, I will send you a link for that because I just signed up for it. Um, so with AARP of Arizona, the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we're not alone. ARP is here in Arizona providing information that can help you and your family. To find out more information, you can reach out to them on their webpage, which is www.arp.org backslash AZ for Arizona. So again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I also would like to give a shout out to Cole and Chris provide for that amazing video that will now kick off every episode in the future. So it was a lot of fun working with them to kind of put that together. And so these are all archived on YouTube. So I will be, um, I'll start sending out the links for that as well. So people can go back and watch prior episodes. Because I know a lot of you have said, hey, you know, I got some of these answers right because I saw a similar question. So... And Francine, thank you so much for saying this is the highlight of your week. I mean, it is for me as well, because it's really one of the few times that we get to sit down and share and just enjoy each other. So again, thank you all so much for being here. And I will see you right back here next Thursday. Same bat time, same bat channel. Have a great rest of your night.